Wins, yes. All right. All right, everyone. I think we can get started. So today it's our, uh, maybe I should first say this is the, the, the last talk of the String Amplitudes Conference. Uh, so it's been a very a big pleasure to have you all here. And uh, I should also say, for those who don't know, we had a couple of COVID cases in the, uh, in the workshop. And that, that's why we are asking everyone to wear a mask uh, for this talk. Uh, with that out of the way, uh, we are very happy to have Aaron here. In case someone, some of the visitors don't know Aaron yet, he is a student of NEMA and soon about to be a postdoc at Caltech. And he is going to tell us about uh, stringing UV completions of the standard model from the bottom up. Take it away. Thanks for the chance to talk about some recent work. It's been a great conference, so um, privileged to give the last talk. Uh, I hope no one's mistaking my slightly provocative title for a gratuitous overpromising. Uh, won't be presenting uh, exactly such a thing, but uh, sort of a different attitude and a way to ask some questions that are hard to ask uh, in the more ordinary ways and find some constraints uh, on parameters that it seems like we shouldn't deserve to get uh, looking at things uh, this way as we cut them. Okay, so a question a lot of people have been asking as of late uh, for a long time, but in particular in new ways, is how can we relate uh, low energy couplings to the UV completion scales and, and the Pong scale and, and other things. So this is done by a, a dispersive representations. One example, uh, Pedro gave a, a nice talk, Piotr gave a nice talk on this. There's been a flurry of progress in different ways. Uh, using dispersive representations to constrain IR couplings uh, from consistency in the UV. So you put in some consistency conditions such as Reggie boundedness in the UV, you impose unitarity, uh, et cetera. Start with some ansatz perhaps, and then you can constrain the parameters in this ansatz from these conditions, okay? Um, but this is difficult in the, in the presence of graviton exchange, notoriously. So in dispersive representations, the avatar of this is the commonly is the T-channel pole that pre prevents uh, accessing uh, forward expansions and dispersive representation when we have this T-channel pole, can't expand around small t. Um, so there's been progress recently that people have made doing a fixed impact parameter analyses. So that's interesting. Um, uh, but uh, we want to take uh, another point of view, okay? So something you can do is try to look at top-down constructions in string theory if you're happy. Um, going ahead committing to, to a stringy construction. That's extremely challenging as well uh, for other reasons. Um, so today we want to, to motivate a halfway place, okay? Where we're going to motivate just some stringy classes of amplitudes, okay? So amplitudes very closely resembling closed string amplitudes, but not using the full machinery of string theory to constrain parameters a priori, or, or uh, constrain the parameters from the top down. Uh, but just motivate these amplitudes at tree level, at weak coupling, and then constrain them using perturbative unitary, okay? So that's all, all we're going to do. Uh, and we'll find that there are some, some interesting statements we can make, okay? So relatedly, you could just say that, all right, if I'm impatient, uh, I could have the explicit goal of saying, take a two to two standard model process, okay, in the massless limit, uh, include gravity, and can I write down anything? Can I write down an amplitude, a tree level amplitude, consistent with Lorentz invariance, locality, causality, and unitarity? Uh, just anything that doesn't, on the, note, uh, on the face of it, violate these consistency checks, okay? So it's a challenging thing to do. It's certainly a challenging thing to do for the full standard model. It's challenging even for a given uh, two to two process, okay? Um, but we're saying that today we can motivate and constrain some stringy classes of amplitudes not constructing them from string theory, but, but motivating them um, very closely resembling, looking basically exactly like string amplitudes, uh, but letting couplings and ranks of gauge groups, et cetera, vary, and then constrain them using perturbative unitarity, and those constraints are, are actually surprisingly stringent. okay? And so the workhorse is gonna be positive expandability of the amplitude's imaginary part. So we will manifest the other conditions just by having a, a stringy prefactor. Uh, so Reggie behavior, exponential softness, et cetera. 
but positive expandability will not be manifest as it notoriously isn't just for say the Venetiano amplitude. And then we'll get interesting constraints from it. Okay. So I'll just review partial of unitarity for people that don't uh, play with this kind of expression all the time. So if we have some two to two process with external particles in representations are uh, I of some uh, gauge or global symmetry group, and then helicities HI, okay? Then uh, the, the symmetry of the invariance group and Lorentz invariance is reflected in this expansion that we can, that it admits the following expansion, okay? So these are the partial wave coefficients. These are, this is a, the relevant basis of orthogonal polynomials. So in the simplest case for scalars, in 4D, these are Legendres, these are the familiar Legendres. For scalars in general D, these are D-dimensional Gegenbauers. And for external helicities in general D, these are very complicated uh, spinning polynomials in general dimension. These are sort of the analogous objects for the uh, global or, uh, or gauge group on the outside for uh, representations Ri, exchanging some representation capital R, in this case in the S channel. Okay, so we, this is some normalization that we, isn't uh, important for us today. And these are what we call the partial wave coefficients. Okay, so this is just a reflection of the symmetry of the problem. Then when we impose unitarity on the amplitude, okay, uh, the full constraint is the following statement on partial wave. So I've suppressed indices. I'd say I'm going with some two to two uh, uh, process. I'm only considering the two to two process, not some, um, uh, two to n scattering. That's where the inequality instead of inequality is coming from. And I suppress indices as I'm considering a process such as AB to BA scattering, uh, where I can only reduce instead of the, the full sort of S matrix as a positive operator, just a, a literal positive number, some positive coefficient. And so since today we'll be working at weak coupling, uh, the two limits that will be of particular interest to us will be we want to check just that we're not violating unitarity by the amplitude getting too big at large energy. Okay, so we'll guarantee that that happens. Uh, and then we'll check this, uh, this positive expandability. Okay. All right. So let's just state all the sort of assumptions on the behavior that we're, we're going to have. So we have the boundedness at large energy. We're also going to require Reggie boundedness. We're considering graviton exchange, so that's S squared. And that's in the complex plane. Okay. Uh, for fixed D less than zero. And then we're also gonna put the reasonable condition. We'd like a fixed number of spins at a given mass level, okay? So by imposing that a residue in S is a polynomial in T, we'll get a fixed number of spins at a given mass level. This is something we'd like, no spikes in our two Frouchy plot. Uh, and of course, positive expandability, that will be the only one we do not manifest, okay? So, that's, that'll be the engine driving uh, sort of interesting inequalities that we get to write down. All right, so let's review just in a simple example, uh, how this works. So we could start with scattering of uh, uh, goldstones. Okay, so scalars with a shift symmetry with some adjoint indices. So at low energies, this is, uh, this is good but it requires unitarization at high energies, okay? We see that the scalar partial wave, there'll be one growing with S, okay? So that needs to be cured by the scale uh, set by F, okay? So can we UV complete? That's the goal in the simple example. And our rules, we want, if we add poles, we want to add poles with physical states. We have our Reggie moundedness and positive expandability on the red, okay? So, we could try Nima's brutal example, you remember from earlier today. Okay, so this certainly guarantees softness. Um, you could complain about the, the polynomial and residues being, um, well, we, sorry, we had no residues. So, um, so there's no obvious obstruction to this from the point of view of softness, but it clearly violates Reggie boundedness very badly. Okay, so it's a complex S. We're certainly not bounded by a power, uh, let alone S squared. And so this is a disaster. So this just illustrates a bit of the tension that maybe you satisfy all but one of these things, but then that other one is violated. So it's, it's a difficult game to play. Um, in this case, it's not so hard though, if we just introduce a massive exchange. 
Okay, so if we introduce a massive exchange, uh, we get the following. Okay, so here we've just introduced the pole at m squared, and I've rewritten instead of the trace basis, these single traces, we rewrite in terms of the projectors, which I'm here. So you have singlet exchange, okay, and then uh, these are scalars. So both statistics would dictate you shouldn't have FABCs. You have these DABCs, though. Okay. So these are the two exchanges you get. Now, if we look at the scalar partial wave, clearly at large S, not a problem so long as our UV completion scale kicks in below the scale F squared. Okay. Uh, all right. So we've softened the behavior sufficiently. But now we've introduced an imaginary part. Okay. So that's the catch. We have to check. It's not such a big deal at this, at, uh, in this example. It just tells us that F squared has to be positive. So F should be real, okay, so from the full. So this isn't uh, a remarkable example. And the, the point is that it's just to illustrate the idea, okay? Because when we wanna look at things uh, with gravity, where we're not gonna have something like the, the Lagrangian for the nonlinear signal model, which makes all these, uh, which makes such a condition trivial, uh, we want to be able to make statements purely from the point of view of amplitudes and see if they're interesting or realistic or consistent with the standard model. Okay, so this is to illustrate the logic of the game. Um, so if there are any questions, I suppose, about that, it's a good time. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so let's review uh, graviton exchange. Okay. So just between identical scalars, we have the same problem. All right, so we have a scale set by Newton's constant. And again, we have the growth of partial waves and we need to cure the amplitude by the time the energy scale gets within the neighborhood of M Planck squared, okay? So below M Planck scale, this amplitude needs to be unitarized. And today we don't wanna give up on weak coupling. We wanna still have a weakly coupled solution, uh, but life's not gonna be as easy as in the case of the, this nonlinear sigma model amplitude, okay? So we're gonna have to work a bit harder. <clears throat> Okay, so why was this easy? This was easy because there was no imaginary part to start. We got to introduce the first imaginary part. So there was no a priori consistency condition on, on, uh, on a residue. And we got to introduce the first one. And so any sign, we get to fix the sign. Not a big deal, okay? So, <clears throat> so that was easy, all right. So with gravity, it's different, okay? There's already a massless pole. There's factorization on that massless pole. There's positivity of an imaginary part there. Okay, so any new states we introduce, uh, we're not free to fix their imaginary part. We also have to have consistency with the positivity of the imaginary part on the graviton pole, okay? So we no longer have the freedom to fix a new coupling and a massive exchange. Uh, <clears throat> we have to respect that factorization, okay? So explicitly, if you just have some one over S pole, okay? And then you add another, uh, another pole as we did in the nonlinear sigma model case, we see that it's mutually incompatible. And any finite number of poles by a residue theorem will require that some of them have the wrong sign and some of them have the right sign, okay? So if you wanna make a product on sots like this, you're gonna have to make an infinite product on sots. So we have to work harder and see if an infinite product on SOTS has a chance. Okay, so that's the motivation for doing that. <clears throat> now, if we want to address it with one prefactor, our, our, our amplitudes with graviton exchange, it's natural to have this product on SOTS in the following way. Okay, so we'll have poles in all channels. So we don't say they have to be the same. So we have some MSI squareds, MTJ squareds, MUK squareds. All right. And now here's where it kicks in that we want a residue in T, a, a polynomial in T when we have a residue in S, okay? So if we'd like that, it's natural to make a product on sets for the numerator, okay? We're just following our nose here to see if we can get anything to work, okay? So we'll also let those Rs be free. Okay, so an S channel regi uh, residue yields the following, okay? And these are the poles we need to cancel. There's an infinity of these poles. Uh, they all need to be canceled, okay? And that implies this condition. So we need 
the sums of MSI, MSI squareds plus MTJ squareds to be in the set of the numerators in U, okay? Plus the cyclic conditions. This should happen in all the channels. All right. So if we require that <clears throat> in every channel, the, the complete easiest way to solve this would just be to have them all be the positive integers times one common mass scale, okay? So this is the easiest way to solve this problem of canceling residues. All right. <clears throat> okay, so that infinite product is of course a very famous function. All right, that's the prefactor in the Virasora Shapiro amplitude. And for free, if we check, we got exponential softness at fixed angle high energy. So we can use this to, to soften high energy behavior. We get Reggie boundedness. So if we dress an amplitude with this, it can have up to S squared scaling and still be consistent with the Reggie behavior we require. And it manifestly has a field theory limit, okay? So we can in principle, and by the way, uh, this motivation this is by no means a derivation. There's not, not a claim of uniqueness, okay? But it's a motivation of something that we can use to cure the high energy behavior of, uh, of massless amplitudes. And this was actually noted in Vera Sora's paper. Uh, his colleague, Charles Goebel, uh, noted that you could der derive the Veneziano amplitude by making this product on sots and just canceling the poles with uh, such a numerator, okay? So let's <clears throat> All right, so this is the game. This is all just to motivate the game we're playing today. All right, the rules of the game are that we compute a massless amplitude that we know either from low energies, we know what uh, gauge boson scattering is, we know, you know what the Higgs amplitude is uh, from the particle content that we have. And then we're gonna just dress it with this prefactor. So we're just gonna dress it with this prefactor and see if it's consistent with unitarity, okay? It's not obvious that it has to be, it's not obvious that it can't be. Uh, but a priori, it's not clear whether you get this an enormous uh, space of, of couplings that are consistent with this or if you get something interesting, okay? And so uh, I'll illustrate why, why. So I'll show you some, I think, interesting constraints. And uh, I think it will motivate uh, different, <clears throat> different things to tackle in more general analyses, such as dispersive representation. Okay, so let's review the... Uh, so if we just dressed our identical scalars, then this is the four dilaton amplitude in type 2b, okay? So we know that's unitary, fine. But what if this described the, uh, <clears throat> if we shut off the gauge couplings, uh, you know, roughly, it, it, we just had a phi to the four theory, let's say, that we, not exactly the Higgs, but if we had some phi to the four theory and we wanted to unitize it, we know it gravitated, then this would be our prescription, okay? We dress this, this amplitude of the massless limit with this factor, and, uh, <clears throat> and see if it's unitary, okay? So let's turn the crank. So unitarity at level one says this, okay? So one interesting thing we find already is that if we set uh, the Planck scale to infinity so that we just tried to use this factor to unitarize a phi four theory, you can't do that. So, just because this thing looks like a hammer, uh, you know, not everything is a nail. So gamma string times lambda is, is not unitary. Okay, it doesn't have a positively expandable magnitude. All right. Okay, so this illustrates uh, how this works. But the, the, the more interesting constraints uh, are going to come in once we have uh, color in the suit. Okay. So, when we wanna do that analysis, we need to re-expand the projectors in one channel in terms of the projectors in the channel in which we're taking a residue, okay? If we're gonna do the proper partial wave expansion, we naturally write to manifest crossing symmetry or otherwise, uh, the amplitude in terms of projectors in all channels, but we need the set of coefficients which solve this constraint, okay? The projectors are orthonormal, so that makes this easy to solve when we have them, okay? And we just take the contraction of the indices, okay? So these are called 6J coefficients. They depend on the four external representations and the two different representations exchanged in each channel, okay? And you need to compute them for whatever process you're considering. Okay, so we can do a very simple example. 
So if we consider <clears throat> fundamentals of SON, okay? So in the S and T channel, we get one factor of the dimension. In the denominator, we get two factors of the dimension, so we get one over DF, okay? All right, so now we can dress the amplitude we had before with some indices, okay? We have some indices. Then we rewrite them all in terms of the projectors in the S channel. So now we have one over Ns here, one over Ns here, if we're doing SON, okay? So we take a residue, we turn the crank. And so if we do this in D space-time dimensions, for scalars in D space-time dimensions, we find that N has to be less than four times D plus three over D, okay? So for example, in D equals four, you can't have these, uh, sort of, you can't have say an SO8 uh, flavor symmetry coupling and flavor multiplets to the exchange, exchange string space, okay? So that's not consistent with perturbative unitarity, okay? So that illustrates how, how, uh, how this goes in the case of colored space or flavor symmetry in this case. Okay. So now let's look at the gauge boson on sucks. Okay. So the, the gauge boson on sucks is uh, so just the, the amplitude in the massless case. Okay. Yeah. 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 and zeros canceling, but at that point, it didn't look unique at all. And now it looks like you are really insisting on using it to reach all these conclusions. It sounds strange. Yeah, it's not unique. And there, so one thing you can do, so there's sort of Q deformed analogs or other analogs you can consider, but it's pretty hard to construct them. And certainly a future thing to do is to consider more general onsets and see what kind of pre yeah. And bigger than several being in this allowed for this answer, right? So it would be interesting to see what you have to do, let's say, to gamma string to make this make yes. this happen. So, so, but one motivation also, you know, from the top down is that very often in the context of some compactification, the you know, you're not resolving sort of the, the compactification at tree level in this case, and the amplitude is going to have this pre factor and look roughly like this. So, obviously, you can't make some global claim no capacity, but it's reasonably well motivated from that point of view as well to consider these kinds of onsets. And it's kind of hard to see how you how to plausibly deform them. It's an interesting question, but. Are you suggesting that if one did some simple isolated explode strap for SON that in four dimensions that I would see some difference when N passes by seven or? So, uh, well, one lesson that we'll see and we'll get to by the end is that it, Pretty crucial, I think, that you have graviton exchange for any of this to be interesting. So even these stringy onsets, at tree level for the open string, it'll be easy to see why it's more. And you'd want to go to higher genus, or like say, consider the annulus. But uh, in the presence of graviton exchange, uh, where you could do some fixed impact parameter analyses, and you know you want the a pi g hanging around, uh, then it's possible, but I think you should see something interesting, but again, it's unclear because as you say, um, we've committed to this ansatz and this is this ansatz is kind of saying you should look like weakly coupled closed strings. Okay, but then there's the question of what if things look like weakly coupled uh, open strings on branch or something like that. And that might have the totally complementary set of, uh, of bounds. So I'll show some bounds in a bit and it might be more or less flipping the arrows the other way. Um, so yes, these are very interesting questions. Um, and yeah, the point of this talk would be largely to motivate that, that that's something worth trying to think about, maybe exploring both in the dispersive realm or generalizing these prefactors. And these constraints might not just melt away once you deform, there, there might still be some robust features. So, uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> so in this gauge boson case, yeah, we've committed to just dressing with this gamma string today. Okay, so this closed stringy prefactor. I'll comment briefly on the uh, open stringy analog later. <clears throat> so we have this. So in 4D, we have this one over in Planck squared. Uh, okay. <clears throat> and we're also going to allow these, calling these as heterotic denominators. Okay. And of course, from string theory, you want to put these in by hand. But there's also a bit of a bottom up motivation for them. It's not totally just pulling it out of nowhere or out of a textbook, rather. 
so the residue at the nth level of this gamma string prefactor will have uh, this factor here. So for example, at level one, we have t times one plus alpha prime t. So you can add this and cancel it and still have a polynomial in t for some residue in s. But if you just started putting other factors to knock, knock it down, you won't get that, okay? So, uh, so this is a natural thing we can do to the denominators, but you can't just keep stacking on additional deformations. It's somewhat rigid, okay? So we're gonna analyze that for, for those two reasons. Okay, so here's a plot in 4D. So here we have G Yang mil squared um, uh, times M Plong squared over M string squared, okay? Versus N for SON and for SUN, okay? So N can be 48 at the most, and uh, SUN can be 25, okay, N, N can be 25. And the maximum value of the coupling is G N mil squared is 2M string squared over M Planck squared. And that's the exact value fixed in the, in the heterotic string, okay? And the fact that that's still the bound in 4D is also somewhat well, uh, well motivated there as the G N mil squared and uh, M Planck squared get the same volume dilution for some internal uh, manifold of volume V. So, <clears throat> okay. So let's look at, and the oranges are when we don't have the heterotic fold. Okay, so it's a much smaller region. All right, so let's look at what the actual constraints are. So these are the states that would become negative norm uh, if we broke the bound, all right? So these are partial wave coefficients that had to be positive. So there's some state that's propagating that would get a, a negative norm. Uh, if it goes to if it goes below zero, and implies the following inequality. Okay, so this is the biggest, the highest dimension representation exchange between the adjoints of SUN. Okay, and this is the singlet. Okay, and they're both uh, scalars at mass level one. So these are the strongest constraints, and they define that plot. Okay, and it's completely analogous for SUN. So this is the largest, uh, the highest dimension representation, sort of totally symmetric uh, permutation in the adjoints uh, and that external indices, okay? We get the same exact bound relating the Yang-Mills coupling, the Planck scale and the string scale, okay? And then the same thing for the scalar. Now, of course, N is different, all right? But it's, in both cases, it's actually, if you infect it, doesn't, not, not so bad. Uh, it's not so hard to see that okay, this was obviously the same, but that this was two plus G Yang mil squared times M Planck squared over M string squared times the adjoint Casimir eigenvalue minus the dimension of the adjoint over 12, okay? So we did two cases, but it's tempting to, to wonder if you did other groups, if you did exceptional groups, uh, if this is exactly the constraint that you would land on, okay? And so, sense in which this is useful is if you have the hope or you have a good reason to have the expectation that even if you're considering some complicated uh, compactification of say the heterotic string that your amplitude, you have a right to think your amplitude will look like this and that this is robust, then it's a pretty interesting inequality for uh, constraining a putative gauge group for uh, that your gauge goes on to start. Okay. All right. Okay, so another thing that you see when you do this analysis is uh, you see something like completeness. So even when you saturate the bound, which means that you set that norm in the S channel to zero, okay, that was at some level. So level one in this case, fine. We set the Yang Mills, we set the gauge coupling to be the maximum value. Uh, <clears throat> but if you consider higher levels and then you just look at the norms, uh, uh, the, co the partial wave coefficients at higher levels, you see that every possible exchange representation uh, appears with a positive coefficient, at least at some mass and spin, okay? So that's some, some kind of form of completeness, uh, which is an expectation some people have uh, for UV completions. <clears throat> okay, so another thing that's kind of curious is in this case, so of course the string scale should be below the Planck scale if this perturbative analysis is gonna be meaningful at all. So we're working at weak coupling. Uh, but in that context, we get this sort of anti-weak gravity bound that we're allowed to bring the string scale only as low as our gauge coupling lets us take it. 
those. Uh, so that's interesting, uh, pointing the other way. And OK, well, one of the motivations was just thinking about the standard model. So if we wanted to dress up uh, Ws and, and gluons and consider this amplitude, then if we consider the heterotic form, then the string scale has to be very high. Okay, and this is uh, this is typically what's found looking at the heterotic compactifications. The string scale uh, stays very high, around 10 to the 18 GeV. And from this point of view, it's uh, perturbative unitarity violation would be a problem that you run into if you were able to bring it any lower. Okay, and then more generally, uh, setting G ang mil squared to zero, the fact that that's disallowed for sufficiently large ranks implies a global symmetry constraint. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So we can also talk about more general dimensions. In this case, we have to let go uh, of the total sharpness that we have a strictly required bound from perturbative unitarity. Okay. Because the if we're considering gauge bosons, the full uh, amplitude has the tensor structure f to the fourth. And we'd require a projection onto spinning polynomials. Okay. So we're not going to carry out that full analysis here. Okay. But a sufficient condition is if, if we strip off the f to the fourth and just consider the amplitudes we've been considering, then positivity on the d dimensional uh, Gegenbauers, the scalar Gegenbauers, has a sufficient condition for unitarity. But it's worth noting that in d equals four, uh, the channel that furnished the strongest constraints was the channel in which. Uh, uh, the spinning uh, Wigner D matrices reduced to the Legendre polynomial. So perhaps that's a hint of, uh, of something nice that happens in higher dimensions as well. <clears throat> okay. All right. So in 10D, if we just run the same analysis, okay, uh, we have the same exact bound on the coupling coming from the same exact exchange representation. <clears throat> uh, this time at mass level three, not mass level one. And then the, the, maximum, the maximum value of n that's allowed is 32 plus 16 over 90. Okay. So the actual values fixed in the SO32 heterotic string are right here. So it's amusing that uh, yet again, uh, unitarity constraints put string theory in a corner of, uh, of an allowed region. <clears throat> okay. And then we can do the analysis again for SON and for SUN. Uh, if we allow the dimension to vary, and then we plot the rank. Okay. So this dashed line uh, is a conjecture that the rank should be less than or equal to 26 minus the number of large dimensions, okay? So the non-compact dimension that, that we're working in is D, okay? This is the bound on the rank. And then this curve is the bound that comes from perturbative unitarity. And it's identical for these, it's piecewise smooth. It's identical here and here for both SON and for SUN. And then they actually depart. They're not the same analytic function of R and D uh, up here, okay? But they meet again in 10D, okay? So in all integer dimension, the constraint uh, between rank and dimension uh, are the same for SON and for SUN. <clears throat> and that really, it's not clear that that had to be because so we see the same structure as we did before in general D. So on this plot, between four and seven, the strongest constraint comes from mass level one. Okay. And it's this constraint. So the adjoint Casimir, the dimension of the adjoint, and these coefficients. Okay. Then between seven and this number, which would actually be, it's not the same for both, and it's a root of some quartic. Uh, polynomial in R and D, uh, but somewhere around 9.9, .9. okay? We have uh, this bound, okay? Where these bounds are occurring where we set G yang mil squared 
to uh, to to two uh, to uh, g ang mill squared to two eight pi g over alpha prime. Okay, so let's fix that to two here, and then in the vicinity of ten d, we get this uh, more complicated constraint. Okay, so obviously for s o n and s u n, these are not the same function of n. All right, <clears throat> but for example, so in the first mass level constraint, when we saturate this condition, okay, and then we put uh, n is uh, two times the rank, and and for S O N and N is the rank plus one for S U N, then they're actually not even the same function of rank and dimension, but they share a common factor. Okay, so they share the same factor enforcing positivity, and that's how they end up agreeing with me. So. From this point of view, it looks like a pretty non-trivial conspiracy of the uh, Wigner-D uh, analysis and the 6J coefficients to, uh, to produce this, okay? And then at the third mass level, those expressions don't even share a common factor, even when we saturate this condition, uh, until we also set the dimension to be 10, okay? So it's really, uh, I found the constraints pretty surprising. Uh, and it's certainly not manifest at each stage of the of the calculus. Okay, so final thing we can look at for fun is uh, just TIG scattering. Okay, so in the massless limit, we can compute the uh, two to two Higgs amplitude, the tree level, turn the same crank. Okay, so these are, uh, these are just the exchange representations of SU2 and U1. Okay, this is the chordic coupling. Uh, <clears throat> and again, we impose positive expandability. Okay, so here's the plot. Okay, so I should explain the, the gray dashed line is if you just take the standard model, okay, and assume nothing else and run it to, to high energies. The quarter coupling goes lambda. Uh, the quarter coupling goes negative around 10 to the 10 GeV, and stays with about two sigma uncertainty within this uh, uh, this gray dashed band. Okay. Now, if we set the gauge couplings to be around uh, the gut scale, so G squares are around a half, then <clears throat> then this is the value. We just have this dimensionless ratio and string squared over M Planck squared and the quarter coupling. And it's curious, this, this steep side here, this bound, uh, that it really doesn't want the Higgs quartic to be negative. Now, this was done without the heterotic denominators. And in the case of the heterotic denominators, lambda has to be strictly positive, okay? So that's in tension with the expectation from the, the pure running in the standard model, having these, these, uh, these heterotic denominators in a deformation of the Higgs amplitude. All right, so I can comment on why the open type completion uh, for gauge bosons is, is not interesting at genus zero, okay? So this would be the natural guess in that case, all right? Or this has leading uh, behavior one over ST. So we get the gauge boson amplitude at least without gravity. So let's just say we, we don't consider gravity, but maybe we can get interesting constraints on N still. We could hope that that would still be the case, all right? <clears throat> You can even do this for the nonlinear sigma model with Loveless Shapiro, where this would be one half minus alpha prime mass, one half minus alpha prime T, and then get rid of this, just zero uh, minus alpha prime mass minus alpha prime T. Okay? But you don't get any interesting constraints for this reason. So this is the residue. Okay? So the residue from the uh, stringy prefactor is this. And then from the SU, so you pick up from the ST planar ordering and the SU planar ordering and you just get a plus or minus sign of these two traces, okay? When you get these two traces, they're always proportional to S-channel projectors. When they're added, you get the single, say for SUN, when they're added, you get the singlet, the delta AB, delta CD, or the uh, symmetric adjoint exchange, the DABCs, okay? And when you take the difference, you would just get the FABC, product of FABC. They're always manifestly S-channel projectors. There's no interesting independence that appears, um, okay? Uh, but 
So if you wanted to get something uh, more interesting, again, you'd want to confront gravity. So you'd want to consider the annulus diagram. So you'd want to have an, uh, an ansatz with a non-planar annulus. Uh, then you'd get your low energy uh, graviton pole. Um, then you have to do the unitarity analysis, uh, which is more complicated than that. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's just review what we uh, what was presented. So I hope I've convinced you that the completions of massless amplitudes, which resemble closed string amplitudes, are surprisingly constrained. So you might have thought that it was pretty open ended. If all you were going to use was this prefactor, then you could kind of make anything you like. Um, and even just trying to do this for the real world, it was non trivial to it, it is non trivial to make amplitudes for the electro weak sector that are consistent with this. So if you have these heterotic poles, which seem more reasonable, maybe, then the Higgs cortic has to be strictly positive. Um, okay, you could get rid of them. But then in that case, you'd probably want to get rid of them in the case of the gauge bosons. And then the string scale has to be sitting right on top of the Planck scale. And it seems like this analysis isn't particularly legit anymore as it's not very weakly coupled. Um, okay, so I think a general lesson as well that could be useful in the analysis of uh, using non perturbative S matrix bootstraps or dispersive representations in fixed impact parameter with graviton exchange is that you could access non trivial constraints on global and gauge symmetry, ranks of gauge groups, or at least dependent on couplings of higher dimension operators. And uh, perhaps you have to make some modest assumptions to really uh, make it close to as interesting or as constrained as some of the plots here, which obviously had a very restricted ensemble. But nonetheless, I think it's something worth, uh, worth trying out for the experts in uh, looking at dispersive representations. Uh, <clears throat> but crucial is, seems like crucial is graviton exchange. Okay, so that was one future direction. Um, another one, as Pedro was talking about before, are generalizations. So Cliff Chung and Grant Remen and, uh, and other people have looked at sort of Q deformations of, uh, of these stringy ansatz. Um, <clears throat> and then if you want to tackle the open string ansatz, you have to confront the annulus. Uh, and in that case, we might expect to get things more like the ordinary weak gravity conjecture or minimum bounds on the rank of the ga gauge group and see the capacity to say, bring down the string scale reminiscent of uh, rain world scenarios from model building from some, uh, some years ago. Uh, okay, so that's, that's it, all I have to say, but uh, thank you. Question for Maybe I can start. Um, so you might, I mean, it's in the direction that Oscar Pedro was already asking. So you had a principle more general access as far as I understand, because you had all these MJs uh, that were still free, mm -hmm. and there was some consistency condition on, on casting various poles. Such that the residues are still uh, polynomials. Um, did you also explore those most general aspects, or is there something that goes wrong? Uh, no, I haven't explored that. Yet. I think the uh, first place to look maybe would be these Q deformations. People have talked about closed stringy analogs of the Q deformations. Those are a little more um, but uh, that's deformation by the end. Yeah, new parameter. Uh, you need just different solutions to that. Yeah, I'm yeah. just wondering whether there's any. I know that there's the version of the Shapiro amplitude that just has integer space spectrum, and then there's a Kuhn amplitude that you alluded to that has like a yeah. kind of accumulation point. Sure. But I don't even know what it's known, whether there's any other solution that is consistent with rigid No, I don't think it's known. It's, a, it's not ruled out. It's a, it's a game you can try to play. It's sort of challenging. You imagine trying to do this for the standard model, but for all the standard models, then uh, uh, the issue of finding, I mean, you have some some spectrum that you read off from any particular two to two amplitude, 
And so some particular set of couplings in the heavy states that are sort of consistent for each one. But then there's some issue of global consistency between all the different uh, possible channels. Uh, but you didn't really quite see that in your example, right? No, no, yeah. You're always talking about sort of one sector. So one mm -hmm. sector of gluons, one sector of pieces. But uh, is that something? Have you thought about how you might input something like that? No, I mean, I haven't. I mean, you'd want to. Uh... Yeah. No, technically, you can just go ahead and now you want positive expandability of the S matrix as an operator because they're not processes where you have some simple scalar function. And, but I don't have intuition yet for how uh, if that will just kill things immediately um, and make it clear that you need something more radical or it just uh, slowly winnows things down. And already in the stringy case, you might want to look at like. So when it times S O I, you have gauge bosons in each factor, and then you want some two by two matrix. And it'd be interesting to see if you get the same kind of Casimir and adjoint constraint, and all the known theories are in some corner. Uh, but that's a natural or another natural generation. And then the general question is: you had some kind of big and small numbers, relatively big and small numbers that kind of show up seemingly. No reason to just have bigger and small numbers show up. So, the main question do you understand where these bigger small numbers come from? Like your small negative quartic, where you're big, big bound on the rank of the gauge. I mean, what do you the, the, the yeah, probably don't have any bigger small numbers in it? Yeah, I think it usually just come from uh, the only place where numbers come from are the coefficients of gig and And so, they're usually, if you understand something about the distribution and how those are, then Perhaps about. I understand that the 26 comes from the gigabytes <laughs> already, but uh, can you tell me the same 26 showing up again and again, or is it a, a different big? Is it a different origin of the big? No, I think it's the same. I mean, in this case, the scalar, uh, yeah. So certainly, all these prime numbers as well, they're coming from high order big and low number of big It's not from the Casimirs, it's not from the group theory. <laughs> Any other questions? Questions on Zoom? Uh, I've thought about uh, bounding things like number of fermion generations. You didn't talk that much about fermions, right? No, I didn't. That's another thing. Yeah, certainly another thing to look at. No, people no, have tried yeah. that without thinking about string amplitudes, right? Like, Sorry? It, people have tried to speculate about adding more fermion generations and if that will violate some consistency conditions, just thinking about standard model, but maybe there's some for Kawa fermions, especially. Yeah, I mean, from this point of view, as long as there's some symmetry, you could hope that there's, yeah, that you probably want that. Not just something like a species ground by too many numbers running in a loop, mm -hmm. which doesn't require as much structure. Right, right. Just that is it. All right, then let's thank Aaron again.